May, June to September of last year. And unfortunately, I lost my mother um, mm. last year. So things kind of stopped. She, she passed away on October 1st of 2015. And so, of course, I lost all momentum and um, stopped really working on it from September. So I don't really count last year that as a full year because I only worked on it from, like I say, J May or June until September. And uh, I started back to work on the boat right before the beginning of the new year. I kind of, you know, as part of my grieving process was to get busy. And so I uh, went back outside and I said, okay, it's time to get back on with life. And so started working on it right before New Year's of last year. And then, of course, it started to snow. So we didn't do much in February and, and, and uh, January. But I would do a little bit of work and post the videos. And uh, I then built a secondary work area. I don't know if you've seen that in the videos, but uh, I have a, a tented workshop that's now in my yard that took a few weeks to get together, built a nice workbench in there and got my workspace together. So that took a, about a month, a month and a half of this year. And so we actually began working on building the frames of the boat, I would say April. So we built from April and May to June. We had all the frame, all the frames are built. And what I mean by built, I'm sorry, they're, they're cut. Uh, each frame has a different angle, you know, how a boat is a boat works in flare and shape so all the frames were cut out uh, in april and may and june of this this year then i started putting them together uh well no then i worked on building the keel in june and july and then we started attaching frames in august so maybe late august because there was a lot going on in august my daughter went to college and so august really i didn't work so September, we probably start putting the frames on, and uh, I hope to get them all on before winter really sets in. And then over the winter, I can just do the uh, the uh, the stringers because that's just basic carpentry. And if it's cold, I won't be able to glue them in place, but I'll be able to cut them in with my router. You know, get everything plain and sanded like it needs to be, and then in the spring, just come back and glue everything together. So that's what my goal would be. Uh, to do in the, over the winter of this year, and then hopefully right. put plywood on next spring or you know next summer. I, I don't know if you've read any of the Larry Party books, but he uh, he built his boat uh, Talison, and he says the most important thing to have in a um, in a boat boatyard is a chair to sit there and think about what you're going <laughs> to do next. Right, I can see that. I can see that. It's it's about being making use of your time. And so there are times when I don't have help and I need help. Like I want to actually attach some frames. It's beautiful, but I don't have any help. So I figured a way I can build a little stand to kind of aid me, uh, you know, to do what I want to do just to be productive. Uh, even because the, the goal is just to go out there, you know, every day and do something. Even if it's, I swear I went out and I did an hour's worth of work a couple of days ago. But it was just something. It just makes you feel like that's an hour's work that's done. That's an hour in the bank. You know, that's an hour closer to the goal of, you know, cruising. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, when I was building my boat, my schedule was pretty much reversed from yours. Um, I tended to work on my boat in the winter because I was at the same time I was working on my summer home, building my summer home in the summer. So that was a, you know, and I can't get into work on the summer home because it's up in the mountains in the winter. So I did something that for me made uh, just, just all the difference in the world. I built a steel shed around my boat. I had my, I had a, a pad, <coughs> I had a pad uh, poured. I formed up the pad and the foundation around the pad because I live uh, on a fairly steep lot. And poured the pad, and then had the hull delivered because I didn't. I didn't have as much energy as you did to actually build the hull. I had the hull delivered, and then once the hull was on the pad, I built a steel shed around it, and uh, it made working in the winter so much easier for me. And then I built scaffolding around it. Of course, mine was upright, and yours is upside down. But so I was able to work on mine in the winter, and I was able, you know, like you say, fiberglass or epoxy. Anytime you need, to, I needed to glue something. I really, 
either had to put heat in the boat at the time, and I used a lot of little electric heaters to do that. But it was always difficult to do anything be it with uh, with you know polyester resin or epoxy resin or or back then it was resourceful glue, which I think they've outlawed since then. You don't see resourceful glue anymore. But uh, so mine was uh, the opposite. Mine and I worked on it in the winter, and. I gave up skiing during that five years. I don't think I went skiing much at all during that five years. And then worked on the summer home um, in the summer. And it took me five years. And you know what? And, and you're probably seeing this right now. I I felt like I accomplished so much. I felt so good when I was out there working on the boat. I mean, I just felt like there wasn't a thing in the world I would rather be doing than going out there and actually producing something with my hands. I mean, I really felt a sense of satisfaction building and you obviously do too, because that's what you do for, you know, you do that, not do for a living, but you see things being built. So, well, yeah. let, me, let me ask you this question if I could. So <laughs> you, you had the uh, slab poured. Um, mm-hmm. Did you, did you speak to someone in terms of how thick you should make that slab? You know, I, I, I grew up with guys in the construction industry and, um, no, I pretty much designed it and poured it myself. I think I put a six-inch slab and put a bunch of I put a bunch of rebar in there, uh, but no, it was pretty much uh, <laughs> cobbled together. Just okay. poured a slab and cobbled it together. Okay, um, and so once you had your slab, um, your boat was your boat is what size? Thirty-two feet. It's uh, twenty-eight feet on deck. And thirty-seven <laughs> feet with the bowsprit and boom can on it. Excuse me. <laughs> got a little uh, hay fever going on so then how did you decide how much space you would have around your boat the reason i'm asking uh what i like to do on my youtube channel is to encourage regular regular people without a lot of skills or who may not be you know like i am a professional builder to some degree i want to encourage them to do what you did to do what i'm doing and so I, I, I kind of like to show how the layman or, you know, I, and I'm not sure what your profession is, but how an average person just attempts this project. So working, th- like I've been through that process. So I'm, you know, going backwards and asking you about your process. So when you decided how much, how when you went through, how did you decide how much room you would have around your boat to work? Well, what I did is uh, I was really limited by my lot size. Uh, I didn't have a lot of room to work, and and I couldn't have built a boat as big as yours in my backyard because I just could not get that length in there Uh, because I had to think about how to get the boat out of the shed once it was done. I wasn't going to tear down the shed because that shed's now filled up with junk that we all accumulate in life. (laughs) And and, uh, so I had to figure out how much I could put in there. I really could not have built a big boat than I have. So what I what my the length of my uh, the length of the uh, shed is I think 30 32 feet. So I've really only got about two feet on each side of the boat and then it was about uh, 15, 20 feet wide, 20 feet wide so I could build a scaffolding around the side of it. And put it up, and I did get a building permit for it. I couldn't get it now, when where I live, but at the time I was able to get a building permit and put it up. Much to the chagrin of my current neighbors, who wish I'd tear the shed down because it's so tall. Because I had to have it tall enough so I could actually get the boat in there and, and stand up and move around in there. But uh, but I was able to to do it, do a building permit, and uh, but it, there's not much extra space in there. Let me tell you, I did have a, a workshop that was in my garage. So my regular garage was filled up with tools where I did a lot of the the cutting and fabricating. Then I'd take it back out to the, the boathouse and put it on the boat. And I would go back and forth all day long because I'd need to cut a little more here, a little more there, <laughs> just back and forth and back and forth because there was really no room to put it on the boat. And, you know, you use the bandsaw more than anything else when you're building a boat. And so the bandsaw wouldn't fit in my shed. So anyway, that's how I did it. Um, and and for me that made the made it so I could work on it in the winter. I didn't have to get up there and shovel off snow if it snowed. And and our our winters here can be fairly cold for long periods of time. 
Uh, but I, you know, I just totally enjoyed the boat building process. This is when my kids were really young and, and I couldn't have afforded to even keep the boat in the water, um, while I was building the boat, but things came around as, as, uh, as the boat was built, my income went up and, and then when we launched it, it was about the right time to do it. So for me, everything worked out, you know, in time and the actual building process was so rewarding to me. That I, you know, I, I sort of feel sorry for people that haven't had that that creative experience of actually building something that you use. So then, once you, once you've got this beautiful now hull sitting there, <laughs> what was the first thing you began to work on? Once oh, you, you, know, once you got the shelter I, built, when I got this hull there, I just looked at it and I just felt, felt so <laughs> overwhelmed. I just thought, oh, geez, here's a a big bathtub, right? Here's right. a big bathtub. Well, now what do I do? And you know, all you can do is just concentrate on one thing at a time. Just right. one. Don't 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 try to envision all that you have to do. You just have to envision one thing at a time. Now, one one thing I did do, and I was going to ask you about this. Before I had the had the hull delivered, I'd already cast my uh, pigs for my keel, and I have an internal uh, lead keel, so that so I I had the crane. Uh, lift up my my lead pigs and put them into the keel, and uh, so so that eliminated any more need for the crane at that point in time. How are you going to do your keel? What are you, are you going to cast your keel yourself? No, the keel is an it's an internal keel, just like I uh, assume you have. Um, uh huh. But since I cannot <coughs> attach the keel here, all that has to be done once I get it to the boatyard. Like I said, the keel is framed. If you look in the videos. If you go back uh, probably to mid-July, you'll see a video of us moving the keel. And my, my I had to frame it here because I wanted it to actually fit. You know, I wanted it to just be able to slide right on when it's time to attach it. So I designed it so it can be, it was built in place, screwed in place. Um, then I took it apart and took the keel off. And so my plan is once I get it to a boat yard to put the keel in place, attach it to the boat, and then to put lead in it or steel. Now, I keep going back and forth because um, the more I get into this building process, the more I realize that my design is way <laughs> overbuilt. I mean, I've got very conventional framing in the design of this boat, and I'm starting to see that it doesn't have to be so overbuilt. So maybe I reduced the amount of conventional framing and just add ballast, which would should give me a better, you know, writing moment and all that good stuff we want. The reason why we want ballast so low. So I don't have to do lead ballast. If I do steel, it's enough. I need about 10,000 pounds, but, um, I think I may add a little bit of uh, lead to that. And either way, it'll be encapsulated in the keel. And my plan was to simply mortar the uh, the material in place. If I was to get lead, it depends on what form the lead came in. If it was already in pigs or bars, I could take those bars and hopefully uh, just mortar them into the boat. Put Take some conventional mason mortar, lay a bed. Put the block in, <laughs> lay some more mortar down, and just mortar them in place in the keel before I attached the plywood to the side of the framing. And so uh, that's what my plan was. It would either be lead or steel rebar. Steel rebar will give me enough ballast in that keel uh, to meet my design criteria. But uh, if I reduce some of the fr from the some of the structure, I may do a little bit of lead in that keel also. So that's the goal. That, that's the, the method. Simply um, mortar in or grout in as you, if you want, if you will, uh, the the lead or steel ballast. Okay. So a, a hint you might want to start thinking about is, and I, and I did this for like five years before I even got my haul, was uh, I'd go around to tire shops and buy their wheel weights. And I did. I had uh, I had five thousand pounds of lead sitting in my backyard when I poured my pigs for lead. So you might want to 
if you're planning ahead and you have the time, start collecting wheel weights from uh, tire shops. I'd go in and, and I would pay them for what their scrap price was and uh, collect lead that way. Just a thought. No, I, I've already, I've already, I've already reached out. I've already started talking to actually uh, gun ranges because gun ranges are a good source of, of, of lead as well. And so I had a, I had, I haven't actually have had an arrangement, but um, I didn't, because you, ha- he wanted me to take all of what he had, <laughs> and I, <laughs> and I couldn't manage all of what he had at this point in time. I would have had to rent a huge truck and got some guys, and I just wasn't situated to do it. This was earlier this year, but yeah, I've already started thinking about that. Even one of my thoughts is even to you can get plenty of wrecked boats, you know, that oh, yeah. have yeah. lead in them, and I'll take the boat right to the dump <laughs> and strip the strip the lead out of it and just leave the boat there. If I if if I find <laughs> something that comes up in the right right uh, vein of what I need, but yeah, we're there. We've all you and I think on the same level. I. I Missed an opportunity this year by not being able to get the lead I could have gotten, but I, I'll I'll be ready. Yeah, what I found was I'd just stop in a shop. I wouldn't come to any sort of arrangement. I'd walk in, I'd say, oh, and then you have a five-gallon bucket of wheel weights that have that'd been accumulating over a while. And, and I'd just say, let me buy it from you. They'd say, okay, and then would weigh it, and I'd pay him, and I'd be out of there. And, and, the, and the nice thing about lead weights, I guess, versus going in and getting a boat that has a cast keel is – a five-gallon bucket of lead weights you can barely handle, yeah. but uh, a, a big keel is uh, it's, that's going to be awfully. You're going to have to have some heavy equipment to move yeah. that thing around. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to cut it yeah. with a chainsaw in small pieces. <laughs> yeah, that's about what you have to do. Uh, anyway, so come out. Um, you're are you got, what? What are your plans as far as doing it yourself? You're going to build the entire interior. Um, a friend of mine, Marsh Party, is a brother of Larry Party, and Larry Party is a big lover of his own wooden mass. But Marsh Par- Party said, I don't care what you do. You'd never want to put up a wooden mass because the maintenance is an absolute nightmare. And and I got to thinking of it. And, I, and I'd actually already bought the Sitka Spruce to build my mast. And I came around to his way of thinking. Um, and so I put on an aluminum mast, which was which is painted in a color called butterscotch. So from a distance, it looks like a wooden mast, but it's not. It's an aluminum mast. And I don't know, (laughs) Kamau, I don't think you're going to want to climb up to the top of that mast (laughs) two times a year, (laughs) sanding and varnishing that down. That's that's what I look at. I look at these beautiful boats with these beautiful wooden masts, and the maintenance on these masts is is pretty pretty strong pretty severe you got to really stay on top of it and if you don't your boat's in danger you know so well, well actually my plan is not to have a finished a um, a varnished spa <laughs> uh believe yeah. me it will be painted and if you if, okay if you look i have a, a picture online i don't know if you've seen it or not but only the bottom of the mast is going to be bright from the boom on down the rest okay. of it will be painted because yeah, I had no intentions of climbing up a mast ever <laughs> to do anything. Um, like I said, I'm I'm north of 350, so that's not going to happen. But actually, uh, I do have designed in my boat a uh, tabernacle uh, in case we ever need to do any work on the rigging. Uh, I can pull alongside a wharf somewhere and actually lower the mast via the tabernacle. So. That's one of the reasons why I want to use a wooden spar because it's easier to do the tabernacle design I have with a wooden spar than with a, an aluminum one because that'll have to be engineered and that's just more opportunity for a, a spar manufacturer to rape me <laughs> <laughs> for what's otherwise a, a street pole, a light pole. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm still up in the air about that. It's only 52 feet. Yeah. And. I'm thinking maybe I add a little bit more lead to counteract the weight of the of the wood, or I go with a different species of wood. But you know, we'll see. I mean, 500 pounds is not too heavy. I mean, there are traditional boats that have a lot heavier spars out there, and 52 feet is not that high. So you know, it's it's all a consideration. Yeah. So l- yep. l- let it me is. ask this question. So what was that first thing that you did, uh, if you can recall, when you got your boat? Well. Yeah, I, re- I remember exactly what I did. First thing is I put in the uh, the lead keel, okay. 
okay. or the lead ballast. And then with the lead ballast, I, I it's, it's an encapsulated lead ballast. So I put uh, poly, I put basically the lead pigs in, and then I put a bunch of a mixture of uh, lead buckshot and or lead BBs and polyester resin around it. And then I put about five layers of fiberglass over the top of it. So if I ever turn turtle, that 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 lead's not going to come flying through the top of the, the the bottom of the boat and kill me. And then the next step was uh, putting in the bulkheads. Uh, and then uh, and then the uh, this is a fiberglass boat, so it's a little different than yours. But putting the bulkheads, and then putting in basically the the structural members, uh, a lot of little bits of fiberglass, and then the sold in the um, the engine tray. Now I'm, I had a big advantage over you. I had Sam Moore's company in Costa Mesa, California, that was building these boats uh, commercially, and any time I had a problem or a question, I could go down. And talk to the uh, shipwrights down in Costa Mesa and say, "How do I do this? How do I do this?" And and Sam was just a perfect gentleman. He let me pick his brains and pick the brains of his workers, and because he wanted to make sure I did a good job on my boat. And I I learned as I went along. I'd start out with big pieces of teak, and eventually I'd make enough mistakes or little pieces of teak left over. <laughs> and uh, you know, you learn as you go along. You're going to make mistakes and. You make a lot of mistakes, and eventually your skills improve as you do this. But uh, so it was, uh, you know, bulkheads, sole, um, you know, basically the rough plywood interior that I had to put in. That was the first step, and then after that, then you start with the uh, running. Uh, I ran a lot of wires before I started doing much more than that. The electrical system, and then uh, then the finish carpentry, and it just step by step by step and. I remember one day I had a piece of wood that was about four inches wide, which was basically my wiring tray that's right up above the uh, right up by the shear of the boat. And this piece had a compound curve on it, turned up this way and turned in this way and turned in this. Way. It took me a full day to fit that piece uh, up and down, up and down, up. And you use that as your wiring tray. But how long that took? To put in there that little that little piece of wood, but you know, that's that that was a finish work on the boat, so I wanted to make sure it looked good. But uh, so it was step by step by step. I mean, it, it was a five year process, but again, I only worked really on it in the winter, so I guess you'd say maybe a two two and a half year process. And uh, yeah, everything worked out fine. It, it's a real fulfilling, rewarding experience, I think, to build a boat. Do, do you have saltwater heads? I do, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. If you could do that or build your next boat, would you do saltwater or freshwater heads? Well, I haven't had any trouble with my saltwater head. I mean, it stinks a little bit, but every head's going to stink a little bit. So, um, no, I, I have not had any problem with my head. I've had to rebuild it a couple times. Um, but I only have one head. Um, and I don't have a shower. My boat's a lot smaller than yours is. And, uh, no, it's been fine. It's a simple boat. The thing I like about mine is it's relatively simple, so I can fix pretty much anything on the boat, too. Right. Yeah. The, the thing I've been thinking about <clears throat> is the, uh, is using a freshwater head system instead of a saltwater. And from, from what I'm, Learning or what I've heard or you know talking to other boat owners is that the crystallization in the uh, saltwater head is really what causes the odor, and so uh, you know that odor you just can't get rid of without replacing the hoses. So uh, I've been reading and listening to uh, people that say that the freshwater heads you don't get that crystallization, and your the plumbing stays a lot more, a lot cleaner. And so I've been thinking about that, and that, of course, gets into how much fresh water I'll be able to carry. Or, uh, you know, in a perfect world, I'll be able to uh, equip the boat with a, a water maker at some point. But again, that's down the line after I've you know, done my sea trials and tested the boat out for a couple of years. But that's kind of where I am because I will have two heads, and I would like to have 
a wife again <laughs> by the time I go cruising. And uh, I think having a less smelly boat would be an attractive thing. <laughs> <laughs> and a shower makes a difference. And also an, uh, an outlet to plug in her hair dryer. That's always a big yeah, deal, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of those creature comforts are things that, from my perspective, um, I think people look at them as luxuries, <laughs> but I look at my boating life. I didn't. I didn't get into this as a twenty-something-year-old. I'm, I'm forty-six. By the time I'm done, I'll be fifty. And I, like I said, I want to live aboard. That's part of my financial plan to cruise. I have to live aboard for a couple of years and save, you know, mortgage income uh, to go cruising. I mean, I could rent my house and probably even after paying the mortgage, make a thousand dollars a month because I have a uh, I have an in law apartment here that I had where my mother lived. So I know I could clearly save fifty grand without blinking an eye just by living on my boat. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, you know. So that's that's easy. So uh, yeah. to do that, I I want to make sure I have a boat that, and I I'm. I would like to be married again. I've, I've been divorced for a few years now, and the boat had nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> it had nothing to do with it. Uh, we got right. separated before I was actually into boating. All but, right. Uh, hey, Kamal, we've gone on about an hour now, and I like to leave my... Good sound. <laughs> I love that exit you use. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, come out. Hold on just a second. I need to uh, use the little boys' room. I'll be. Appreciate you uh, sticking in there. I only have a couple more questions, and sure. they're, re they're really about the systems of the boat and about your decision making process. So, um, so we talked about the heads. Um, what what about your uh, electrical system? What were your considerations in uh, choosing an electric system uh, in your boat? Twelve volt versus twenty four. Battery banks, charging, all that stuff. Well, I didn't really even consider 24 volts. I know a lot of people are now, and, and actually a lot of the windlasses are geared for 24 volt. But my boat's pretty small, and I could get by with 12 volt. Now, if you're going to be a, a – with a boat as big as yours, you you might want to consider 24 volt. But so many components are geared for 12 volts. So you might have a 24 and a 12 volt system. In other words, you might have a 24 volt for uh, for some of your high energy needs, and the one I'm thinking of in particular is is your windlass. Um, but a lot of lights and a lot of the most of the other stuff on a boat is is 12 volts. So you might have a dual system for your boat. That's exactly, that's my that, thoughts. That's exactly what I've considered so far because of the windlass. Uh, <clears throat> actually, when I started the design of my boat, it was designed to be an electric electric boat. I was going to do an electric propulsion system until I realized that it cost me about 60 grand. <laughs> so, uh, but I have a huge space in my boat right dead center. It's three foot wide, five foot deep, or five foot long and three foot deep that was set up for battery bank. Franz, that's a huge space <laughs> for battery That's system. great. I wish I had that sort of space in my boat, yeah. but uh, that's great. Right. And that's the central battery, central battery bank. And so I now realize I don't even need on one, on one level, a one three by three by five level, I could put a hundred some odd amp hours worth of batteries. So I have more than enough space for the battery bank. So what I'm thinking about is doing three different battery banks, uh, uh, a house battery bank of probably. You know, whatever we figure that calculation out to be, a starting battery bank, and then a 24 volt bank for those 24 uh, volt components. And that 24 volt battery bank will be actually, I want to put that in the uh, in the forward berth area because that'll be closer to the windlass. And then, you know, I won't have to run that that thick wire all the way from the from the main battery bank all the way back to where the windlass is. So I had already thought about that, and so. You know that just helps me to uh, feel confident in that decision uh, that I'm doing. What about the type of battery that you use? Are you using a a, a, a lead acid, a wet battery? Or are you using uh, AGM? No, I uh, well, I, if I had my 
my preference and I could get them where I'm at, I would go with uh, the Trojan. They used to be called T3s, six-volt golf cart batteries. Uh, but I can't get them where I'm at. So I'm using the uh, AGMs where I'm at, and they don't hold up anywhere near as those. Uh, the best batteries I've ever had were the uh, the Trojan T3s at the time, and I had uh, four of those uh, wired in uh, in series and then uh, wired in parallel. So I had two of the 6 volts wired in series to give me 12 volts, and then uh, then the two uh two banks of 12 volt wired wired together to give me a lot of amp hours and that was a that was a great battery that lasted me well all the way from when i launched the boat all the way five years up in the northwest and all the way into the mediterranean and finally i had to change those batteries when i got to greece so those wow. batteries lasted i think at <clears throat> least uh at least no 12 years Wow. Uh, 10 years, 12 years. Uh, but every other battery I've, I've got since then lasts maybe three years, and then I've got to replace them. And batteries are expensive, as you know. So, so I, those Trojans, were they, you had to, they, those were wet cell? They were wet cell. So you had to keep your eye on to make sure you, you uh, key on it, was making sure the tops of the batteries were clean and, um, and make sure the uh, you you put enough water in. So you need to check the water level on them on a consistent basis. I mean, I would go through probably a couple of gallons of distilled water in a season, uh, filling those up. And they they have big they have big reservoir capacity, so it's hard to get down to the. You'd really have to be negligent to actually run the. Uh, run the water off of those batteries because they have a big reservoir for the water for exactly that reason. So, so I, I really like those Trojan. Those are great batteries. So cost wise, you really think a wet battery is best? Well, um, yeah, I think so. Uh, if I could, re if I could get the exact same batteries over in Europe where I'm at, I would go back to the Trojans. But I can't get them over there. I have to go with the AGMs, and they don't fit as well in my boat as, as the as the Trojans did. Wow. But yeah, that that I found those were good. Now when I was a sailor with Neil. This summer on Arcturus, on Andy's old boat, I was so impressed to see those uh, Trojan Trojan batteries down <laughs> below. So uh, Andy knew what to get. So though, uh, and they were brand new batteries. I said, Neil, you got the best batteries on board here. So I was really, I was really happy to see those again. So is that like a uh, every time you want to go out, you, you check the, ba the batteries to top the month? Oh, is that once a month? No, once a month, once a okay. month. Yeah. Yeah, and then the other key on those is make sure you, the the they do tend to have a little condensation on the top of the batteries. Make sure you take a paper towel around and wipe them off every now and then. That's about all. Okay, so really good access to the batteries then if you're going to use a wet cell battery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. just you just help me think about some stuff because one of the other things I want to do is I want to have <clears throat> and call me a, a fool or not, but I want to have uh, the opportunity to, to run at least in one cabin in air condition and I have plenty of opportunity for battery capacity but to get the amp hours necessary to run an AC um, even with the generator um, it's just a lot so uh, initially I was stuck in the, in the AGM mode but hearing reputable you know word that those those trojans because you still can buy those trojans I, I see them all the time is is a it, it makes me feel that i may be able to reach this goal uh without spending fifty thousand dollars on the freaking batteries yeah i i i like those i know i might i know they've got these new um what are they called uh uh, some people are talking lithium and then other ones are these, uh, these other new batteries and they haven't stood the test of time yet. In my opinion, I'm, I'm not yeah. really an the early adopter of this technology. It's some type of foam, sodium foam. Or yeah. Something like that. Carbon yeah. foam or something like yeah, that. Yeah. 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 I heard Andy talk about those a couple of months ago. I had somebody on my podcast uh, a while back talking about them. And there are some real advantages to them because they last a lot longer, and they okay. hold their they have the, a lot more a lot bigger recharge numbers on them. Um, but they're about three or four times more expensive too. Right. 
So if you want to get up on not the app hours, you're going to be spending a lot more money on them. Now, you might consider, and I've seen this uh, a lot overseas, is uh, these little um, Honda generators. Those yep. are very, very quiet, very highly efficient. You got the 2K generator. You, they got the 1K generators. You got a big enough boat, you could store that down below. And I've seen people just take them from down below, put them up on the deck, and, and run their electricity needs. And let me tell you, I've wished I've had air, air conditioning many times. So I don't think you're crazy for that. I'd, I would love to have air conditioning in my boat. Um, and a lot of boats in the Mediterranean do have air conditioning on their boats. So. Right. Uh, and then you're, if you're going in marinas, you'll be able to plug in. Now, on your uh, on your battery charger, let me suggest that you get a dual voltage battery charger um, for both 210 and and uh, one, 220 and 110. And West Marine has one that that I've got on my boat, so I can now I don't have to change. If I ever come back to the states, I'm not going to have to re rewire my battery charger from. Um, from 210 to uh, to 110 or 220 to 110 and uh so when i first sailed over the mediterranean the first thing i got when i got to spain was a big old transformer to transform uh electricity from 220 to 110 and then i ran my charger off that for years and years and years before i finally replaced that about four years ago going forward i would say uh Get, and there's more battery charges available that have both circuits on there. So get that, you know, get one of those for charging your batteries early okay. on. You know, I hadn't thought about that. That is a, a lesson learned today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, you know, you you may be thinking you're be sailing in uh, where it's all 110, but you may hop over to the Europe or someplace as 220, and then you want to plug into shore power, and it's just a lot easier to to be able to to plug right in. Yeah, I do. Would I would love to do all the great circuits. I would like to do, you know, um, my my initial plan is, you know, after I've sailed for a few seasons here in the Chesapeake, jump over to Bermuda, you know, of course, do the Bahamas and of course the Caribbean, and then do the, you know, go to Europe, come back around, go down to Africa, come back, and you know, if if that's successful, do a Pacific jump, man. Those those are the the dream goals, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. as Lynn and Larry Party say, you don't want to speak your plan too much. Just kind of, you know, go. Just go do it. Right. Just, just go live your plan. Because you may it. be like me. You, you get somewhere and you say, why do I want? Forget this <laughs> round the world nonsense. It's pretty damn good where I'm yeah. at right now. <laughs> why the hell go anywhere else when it's so perfect right here? That, that's, that's, that's an idea. Um, and the other question I want to ask you about was about your rudder and your prop. And uh, the engines, engine selection, like how did you work through that process of choosing what you would do? <clears throat> well, I have nothing but wonderful things to say about my engine. Uh, it's a Yanmar 3GM30 uh, diesel engine. I'd never even considered uh, gas. I would not even consider gas on a boat. So you need to have diesel. Right, yep. um, uh, I chose Yanmar because uh, they just have a reputation of being bulletproof engines. And I'm here to say they are bulletproof engines. It's it's uh, I've had very little maintenance problems on my boat. The maintenance I've had to do on my boat has been basically finally chain uh, deliming the heat exchanger, which I was wondering why I was overheating, couldn't figure it out. And then the guy said, "Well, when was the last time you delimed your heat exchanger?" I said, "Well, I've never delimed my heat exchanger." So, well, <laughs> that's your problem right there. And uh, uh, impellers, saltwater impellers, you know, the freshwater pumps and the saltwater pumps. That's really the only maintenance I had to do on my boat in, uh, well, since 1986. Other than to change the oil and fuel filters, keep the fuel filters clean, use get some good Raycor filters to pre-filter the fuel before it even gets up, goes into the engine filter. Um, I don't know if they, your boat's a lot bigger. I'm sure Yanmar has engines big enough for yours, but I didn't want to get Volvo engines because uh, I've heard it's really hard to get parts for a Volvo engine. Right. And uh, let me tell you, I've been all through the Mediterranean, and you can get parts for a Yanmar motor pretty much anywhere, uh, except Croatia was a headache. It was difficult in Croatia and Montenegro, but in Turkey and Greece, it's, it's fairly easy to find uh, Yanmar boat parts. But Volvo is, uh, has a good reputation as a marine diesel. Um, 
And some people have used the Detroit engines too. Um, I just don't have any really experience to speak of for those engines. What are you thinking of for your engine? Uh, a beta. I um, pretty much settled on a beta once I got out of this foolishness about electric prop. And uh, the reason being a Kubota engine, and um, oh, that's a Kubota engine. Yeah, it's a Kubota. It's, engine. Okay, okay. I'm not familiar with Beta, but if it's a, I've I've used the Kubota tractors, and they're fantastic engines on the Kubota tractors. So, yeah. So that's the one I've kind of settled on. Um, the horsepower, I think, the 65 horsepower is what they recommend I get. Um, and then there's all these other <laughs> components uh, in terms of alternators and uh, just so much. That's one thing I really enjoy about this process is the learning all this crap. <laughs> Every, everything's going to be a trade-off. I mean, yeah. you, you, you know, everything's a bit of a trade-off and everybody's got an opinion on it. I keep thinking I want to have a higher output alternator on my boat, but my existing alternator seems to work just fine, so I've never bothered changing it. Right. And you put a higher output alternator on, then you got to change a lot of other things. But if you're just starting from from day one, you may as well put on there what you want. So Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. The engine I've sourced so far is like 17 grain. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, and that's not installed. So I, I have a good mechanic locally that would probably help me with that. Um, but that's like the one big purchase, you know, that's, yeah. go, that's going out yep. and buying a car. <laughs> yep. And yep. And if you do it right, it'll last you the life of the boat too. So. Right. So, you know, right now I don't have $17,000 sitting in the bank account waiting to go buy a damn engine. <laughs> so that's going to take some figuring out. I don't want to buy a used engine, though. I really want to get a new engine. Just yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. Start out with a new engine to begin with. Keep it, take care of it from day one, and then you'll, you know, I think right. you'll be happy so with it. I'll, I'll, I'll have no note for the boat, but I'll have a note for the engine. <laughs> You know, so how was the yeah. install process for your engine? Did you uh, do a lot of the work yourself? I did it all myself. Oh, yeah, really? it was all I did it all myself. And uh, uh, fortunately, again for me, I had an advantage. I had a pre-made engine pan that I bought from Sam Moore's, which was designed for this engine. And so I'd already fiberglassed the engine pan. Pan that was a fiberglass engine pan. So I'd fiberglass that in place. So. At that point in time, it was a, ma a matter of uh, putting on the motor mounts onto the engine pan. And then with basically come-along jacks, I uh, was able to lift it up and put it in um, and put it right on there through the cockpit and on there uh, on, the, on the motor mounts. Now, at that point in time, I had to go with a prop out through the, uh, the stern of the boat through the, um, the cutlass bearing. So you had, to drill that, you had to drill that yourself, right? I did, but remember, I, I had I had a tube that I again that I bought from Sam. Uh, once I'd cut the hole, I put the tube in, and then I, um, I mean, this was this is a one time shot. You can do this because I had a, a little bulkhead between uh, the absolute stern of the boat and uh, and where the prop shaft goes to. So there's about a six inch uh, layer of. Uh, play that I had there. So I ran the shaft through the, uh, through the, the cutlass bearing and, and mounted the flange, the, 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 the drive flange to the engine, got that all lined up. And then I poured the uh, resin around the prop shaft. Ah. So, ah. so I didn't have to do any okay. serious alignment. It was, it was, uh, it was without, you know, because you hear all these alignment problems. I never right. had that because I was aligned right from the get-go. Right. That is a good idea. <laughs> wow. Okay. I got you there. Okay. So basically you drill a big enough hole, you install the engine, the shaft, and then you epoxy around it. That is beautiful. Thank you again. I swear. I'm going to have to name a cabin after you on my boat or something, man. <laughs> What and uh, so what about your uh, your your uh, your rudder? Did you 
did the boat come with the rudder or did you yeah i bought the rudder from sam i didn't build the rudder okay uh, i do have the plans to build the rudder out of wood and it would have been fairly easy to do it but uh but mine's sort of the barn door approach to a rudder you know it's just a big aft hung rudder that hangs off the back of the boat so it's a big rudder so i didn't have any real serious you know i have the cheeks on the rudder which are ash that need to be replaced now after 20 years right but uh, that's one of the projects I'll do next year. So, what, what type of uh, stock is it? Is it a solid pole or what is it? It's a foam core rudder. Okay. Yeah. What about the actual the pole? Is it a stainless steel pole? Oh, you mean the pindles and gudgeons? Right. Yeah. Oh no, remember, no, no. I'm sorry. You, you, I forgot. You said barn door off the back. Yeah. Of okay. So yours is a tiller. Right. Uh -huh. My boat's a tiller. Okay. So you use a wind vane? Yeah, I love my wind vane. Okay. What, what kind is it? Uh, it's one I basically copied from Larry Party's design. I have a, a ah. video out there. You might check it out sometime on on uh, on my wind vane design. So, it pivots off the uh, backstay of the boat and and creates my uh, my wind vane. So basically, trim tabs. Mm hmm. Trim okay. tab off the back of the rudder. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah, there's a YouTube video out I put out oh, quite a while ago, which details how I build it, and uh, I take a lot of close-up photographs of the uh, the bearing components that make it work. So check it out sometime. I uh, I'm not sure exactly what the I think it's just medsailor.com at youtube.com something like that. Yeah, I've, I've been on your uh, I've been on your website, but I've not seen your YouTube page. Yeah, I know there's a link in one of my posts somewhere, but okay. I probably ought to put a link in the in one of the pages on my website for it. Okay. But. And the last question is, <laughs> oh, well, it's a two part two part. Of, what was your biggest like problem that you encountered during the whole process, and what would you say is your greatest reward? You know, I don't know that I really had. Uh, any any real big problems it was just a step by step process i mean the problems are when you screw up a on a $200 piece of teak it suddenly becomes a less valuable piece of teak and i mean i mean i made lots and lots of mistakes along the way but there was no real big problem it was just a, a methodical step by step process in building a boat as you're finding out you know you can't do anything till the first job's done and then move on to the next problem but uh i don't i don't i don't really remember any big problem fortunately when i when i uh did the rigging um my my friend marsh party used to be a professional rigger and he came down and and he measured out all my stays, you know, we basically laid it out in the driveway, the the mast in the driveway, and and he knew exactly how to go about measuring for the rigging, and so I sent off the the lengths to a um, to Joe Sones in Southern California, who's a hand rigger, and I had uh, hand hand splices on all of my rigging on my boat, wow. and uh, he did those, made them to to length, and shipped them up to me and when we launched the boat up in Bellingham, Washington, I had all my rigging there and guess what? It all fit. Wow. Now that could have been a nightmare. I mean that really could have been the 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 problems occurred, but fortunately it didn't. So I mean I guess it's because I had good people volunteering to help me on that sort of thing. So I would say when you're doing that, that's probably one place you might want to get some professional help is make sure you get a rigger that measures the uh the rigging for your mast and get that all ready. So when you step the mast, everything's ready to go. Wow. Yeah. It's, I, I'm really interested in doing the, uh, the, the ducks or the synthetic rigging too. Ah, um, yeah. 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 Cause like I said, my mast is not too tall. I mean, 52 feet is not very tall. No. And, um, the displacement, even though it's a 54 foot boat, the displacement of the boat is like a West cell, you know, 42 basically um i don't know if you follow drake paragon or not but i think his 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 west sale uh i think when he was in the uh travel lift was thirty six thousand pounds so i mean it's a long boat but it's not a very heavy boat relative to what i'm trying to do yeah yeah so, yeah, well, yeah I, I you know when i sailed with neil neil fletcher this summer um 
he has, of course, that's Andy's old boat, Arcturus, and Andy put that the synthetic rigging on his boat. And I was looking at it pretty carefully, and that's something you can do by yourself. I mean, you yeah. learn those splices yourself. You can do that by yourself. Yeah, yeah. And you can repair it yourself if you need to. Mm-hmm. And the way my rig is designed, I've got uh, a solent in the front. So I've got two stays in the front. Uh, I've got a split back stay because I have an arch. So they have two actual two two lines actual come down on either side on both sides and then there's a cap shroud intermediate shroud and then two lower two lower stays so it's 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 pretty well uh suited um uh, for contingency if anything fails it's basically got um uh, two stays in any any one direction with a force mm-hmm. applied so uh and using something like the synthetic rigging you know gives you the ability to be able to fix it uh underway so i really really like that as well but um well franz thank you so much i appreciate you <laughs> staying on for another 20 minutes and helping me with my questions i really have learned a lot and i i, I really come to enjoy your podcast and, and very much appreciate you uh what you bring to the sailing and boating community <laughs> thanks kamal it's great to meet you talk yeah, to you glad, later glad we finally worked it all out technology wise <laughs> okay talk all to right. you later Bye bye